Welcome to Beyond the Next Chapter. I am your host, Whitney Clark, and today we are taking you to Minnesota in a new summer romance. We're joined today by Abby Jimenez. She's not only a New York Times bestselling author known for her romance novels, but she's also a Food Network winner who founded Nadia Cakes out of her own home kitchen back in 2007. And she is out with a new book just in time for the summer called, fittingly, Just for the Summer. Abby, thank you so much for joining us. How's it going? Great. Thanks for having me. So the book has been out for a couple weeks now. What has the reception been like? What has the press tour been like? How are you feeling about it? I am thrilled with how this book is doing. It came out as a number one New York Times bestseller, which is my first number one New York Times bestseller. And it's been three weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. So that's about as good as I could hope for. (laughs) When did you start working on this novel? I started at the beginning of last year. I work on, I only do one book a year. I turn them in January of every year and then they come out the following uh, spring. So yeah, it's been it's been a long time coming. I, from start to finish, every book that I work on is about you know two years in the making before it finally hits the bookshelves. Okay, cool. And we don't like to, we try really hard not to give like a lot of spoilers uh, for people who are tuning in. Uh, give us sort of a, a rundown about the book. What can readers expect if they're gonna be picking it up this summer? Sure. So Justin and Emma have a curse. Everyone that they date goes on to find the love of their lives after they break up. And Justin goes viral with this, am I the a-hole Reddit thread? And tells this story in this thread that Emma reads and Emma reaches out to him and they decide that if they date each other, in theory, their curses will cancel each other's out when they break up with each other. So Emma, who's a traveling nurse, comes to Minnesota to date Justin just for the summer. And of course, things don't go as planned. Uh, All my books are rom-coms, but they do touch on more serious topics. There's a lot of depth in this. Um, Publishers Weekly gave it a star review and called it an emotional tour de force. I would say that's probably my biggest takeaway from your books as well, this one in particular. Again, not to give any spoilers away, and this is something that's talked about early on in the book, Justin has a mother who's going to be serving time in prison. Why was that a storyline important for you to include in this book? Both of the parents in this book are going through something and the things that they're going through are affecting their children. And I wanted to have the parallel of what Emma's dealing with, with her very toxic mother uh, and what Justin's mother's going through. And both both characters and both mothers in the book are experiencing what is the effects of trauma, essentially. And I wanted to show the different kinds of trauma and the different ways that that can manifest in somebody's behavior and how it can affect who we turn out as people and how it affects our relationships ultimately. How do you balance those really sort of deep, important topics, mental health with fun, flirty romance and quick dialogue between Emma and Justin? Uh, I mean, I love I love writing witty bantery dialogue. That's sort of what I'm known for. So it's, you know, I think you can laugh at a funeral. I think that even in the midst of the worst kind of tragedy, you can find humor in it, even if it's not funny to you at the time, it might be funny to the reader reading it. But um, I do a lot of due diligence when I depict these more sensitive topics. I have uh, a ton of sensitivity readers that I use on my books. For this particular book, I used a, a trauma-based um, a psychologist who helped me to pick the mental health aspects in this book to make sure that I get it, I get it right, and that it's done accurately, and ultimately that whoever reads this, uh, that I don't harm anybody who's reading this with inaccurate information. So it's um, it's something I'm quite good at. All my books are like this; they all touch on these deeper subjects, but they make you laugh at the same time, and it's not in a way that's poking fun at these issues. It's just um, you know, a, a delicate balance between the, the light and the heavy in my books. For people who maybe uh, read this and see themselves in these characters, maybe they have a mom like Justin's mom or Emma's mom, what do you hope they take away? And what is sort of the the feeling you hope they take away when they read this? There's a line in the book that has really resonated with readers. And the line is, in a world where you can choose anger or empathy, always choose empathy. I think that understanding someone can be very helpful in your own healing journey. And just because you understand someone or you have empathy for someone doesn't mean that you don't have boundaries with them. It doesn't mean that you, um, you know, have to keep them in your lives or have to put up with what it is that they're doing to you or even to themselves. It just means that you strive to understand that nobody wants to be the villain in your life, even if they are. 
and everybody is the product of something that's happened to them in their own in their own journey. So I, I've, I, you know, actually, I was really surprised at how much people related to this book. I thought, you know, with the toxic mother thread that it wasn't going to be my most, my most relatable work. And so many people mm. have reached out to me to tell me that this book really touched them, that it made them feel seen, it made them feel, feel validated. Because so I think even if you have a fantastic mother in your life, I think we all have somebody who has been toxic for us. I think that's a universal experience. And um, going with Emma on this journey and, and Justin on his journey as well, I think has been really healing for people to read. You brought up uh, boundaries and I think boundaries can be really hard to set for a lot of people, for younger people, older people, particularly millennials who are maybe struggling with their relationships with their parents and kind of what they went through. Do you have, um, did you draw any from your own life experiences in terms of you know how it can be difficult sometimes to set those boundaries with um, loved ones? Of course, of course, I draw my own experiences because again, I think we all have that person in our lives. And it is such a hard balance to strike, you know, just deciding whether or not to keep somebody that you love, but who might be harmful to you in your life, you know, deciding that uh, you're going to pick you, that you're going to love yourself more than you love them. It's It's so hard to do and it's so nuanced. And you know, I think therapy is so helpful when it comes to stuff like that. And, you know, my books always, always um, uh, talk about the benefits of therapy. I mm -hmm. think, you know, if you're having a hard time working this out or what you should do, I think a therapist can help you work through it and help you come to the kind of decisions you might need to make, which can be really difficult decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly so. Um, again, I, I, going back to sort of the dialogue between Emma and Justin, particularly at the beginning of the book, when they kind of start messaging each other on social media, what is it like for you to sort of create those meet cute moments and the, the dialogue between the two, which was really charming throughout the whole book? I love writing dialogue. It's one of my favorite things. People always ask me, how do you, how do you write dialogue? And I said, just write the way you speak, you know, listen to how people speak the cadence of their speech and read it out loud. Uh, because that will really help you, you know, to tell if it sounds natural or not. But it's just something that I've always been really strong at. And I love, 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 love writing fun, witty dialogue. Sometimes I will, you know, uh, think of a line that I might not necessarily use for this book, but I have it on on standby on my little, you know, notes app waiting for the next book where I can fit it in. Um, it's so fun to read that. And, you know, you will find that throughout the entire book. It's not just in the beginning of the book. It carries throughout the entire book. Mm -hmm. The chemistry really just pops off the page with these two. And you can tell that they're not only are they uh, romantic interests for each other, but they're also really good friends. And I, and I love writing friends to lovers. It's so much fun for me. Do you have any other tropes that you love? Um, second chance romance, anything else that you like to include or that you personally like to see in books? I love a good slow burn romance. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like that we earn it, um, you know, that you're just like screaming at these two to kiss. <laughs> um, and there, this is a really good slow burn romance. Um, most of my books are just because I, I really love building that tension and building that relationship and making it really believable by the time the characters finally get together. How long have you lived in Minnesota? I've lived in Minnesota 12 years. I used to live in California. Uh, we moved out here to open up more of our cupcake shops. So we actually have two Naughty Cakes locations here in Minnesota, one in Minneapolis and one in St. Paul. So how did you get into baking and into the cupcake world? I was pregnant with my third baby in three years and I ended up losing my job. This was back in 2007. And I decided to take some cake decorating classes at a local Michael's just to fill the time and try and distract myself because I was really depressed that I had lost my job. And I had my baby and I decided to make cakes out of my house for a couple of months. We figured out what I was going to do because we couldn't afford for me to not work. And the couple of months turned into two years. I baked out of my house with a newborn, a one-year-old and a two-year-old all in diapers mm -hmm. and ended up finally going to have surgery for severe carpal tunnel in both hands and told my husband, I can't keep doing this. Like, who does this? People that do what I do have a bakery or they have a daycare. And uh, my husband said, well, let's open a bakery. So we ended up charging the entire $125,000 opening of my bakery on our credit cards. And the wow. first Naughty Cakes was born. And um, yeah, I ended up going on Cupcake Wars and I won. I did a few seasons of Fabulous Cakes on TLC. I've had, I've had many different careers in my lifetime. <laughs> How do you balance now writing with uh, Nadia Cakes? 
Well, Naughty Cakes has been around for quite a while now. So our location, our first location has been open for over 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, both of the other locations are on their 10th and 11th year. And uh, I've got really great managers. I've got really great people that enable me to be out of the business so that I can focus on the writing, which is which is honestly my passion. It's my the the best thing I've ever done. I enjoy every second of it. When did you really start to pursue writing as a career? Like at what point in your life were you like, I want to be an author, I want to write a book? I never thought that I could be an author. I always thought that being an author was something you had to earn. You had to go to college and get a, you know, get a degree to be able to be an author. You had to have a blog or you had to be a journalist or something. I never thought that it was just something that me, somebody who, you know, never went to college could just start doing and get really good at and end up publishing books. Um, in 2017, I finally had my bakeries to a place where I didn't have to be there every day running the kitchens. And I went back to reading, which was one of my favorite things to do um, all throughout my youth. And I kind of lost that for a, you know a while when I was having my kids. And I got back into reading and I was reading romance. And after a few months of reading romance, I was really finding myself looking for a particular kind of romance that I wasn't able to consistently find. I wanted something that was funny, but that had but that had depth. And usually if you find something that has a lot of depth, it's not going to be funny. Or if you find something funny, it's going to be a little bit lighter. It's not going to have the depth that I was looking for. So I decided to write my own book and ended up on a site called Critique Circle for a year, learning my craft and wrote a really fantastic book on there that ended up being the Happy Ever After playlist, um, queried an agent and the rest is history. So it's wow. been uh, seven years now since I started my writing journey and I'm on my sixth published book and it's my first number one New York Times bestseller. Wow, congratulations. That must just be such an incredible feeling. Yes, it really, I'm just, I pinch myself every day. <laughs> what is it like for you going on the press tours and meeting readers and getting to talk to readers and people that are so engrossed in these characters and your work? You know, as an introvert with social anxiety, <laughs> I would not have told you that going on book tour would be one of my favorite things, but my readers have just made it such a positive experience for me. It's something I really, really enjoy. And I really enjoy meeting other authors as well. You know, most of these um, events are hosted by other authors and my readers are just fantastic. Like it's like meeting up with a group of friends is what it is, what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And I love my characters so much and I love that they love them and I enjoy talking about my characters. So it's really just, it's, it's something that's so fun for me. I look forward to it every year. So let's talk a little bit about the location of this book. At first, Emma's friend, Maddie, is hesitant about going to Minnesota. You know, she doesn't want to take the assignment, uh, the traveling nurse assignment there. When people read this, what do you hope they take away about Minnesota and how beautiful it is and about where you live? Minnesota is absolutely stunning. And as somebody who lived in Southern California, we chose to move here. Um, we had no family here. We had no um, there was nothing that drew us to Minnesota other than the beauty of the state. That's literally what brought us here. And we've put down roots and we're never leaving. It is a fantastic place to live. It's gorgeous. Yes, the winters are long, <laughs> but you know, you get you have to get into all of the fantastic outdoor activities that you can do here in the winter, like ice fishing and snowmobiling and the ice castles and and you know, it's just it's just a gorgeous place to live. Even as I sit here talking to you, I'm looking out into what is a wildlife reserve behind my house and there's wow. deer meandering through the marshland back there and it's just beautiful. Was there a bit of a culture shock going from Southern California to Minnesota, or did you guys just adapt really well and just instantly kind of fall in love with it? You know, there was a, a little bit of a transitionary period, but we actually came in 2011 and it was a really uncharacteristically warm winter. I mean, mm. extremely warm. And I remember we got here, we were like, oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> That we've had we've had some more serious Minnesota winters since then, but you know you just you get the right clothes, like Justin says in the book, and you do the door to door dash. You know you know you don't even put on a jacket half the time. Um, you know you just get used to it. You adapt. Yeah. So like you know in Southern California, like a nice day is seventy degrees. I lived in I lived in Southern Oregon. I'm from Southern California as well. So I lived in Southern Oregon for a period of time, and it's kind of crazy how you adjust. Like it, it would be like fifty five degrees, be like oh it's a really nice spring day. In Southern California, you would be like in boots and jackets and UGGs. Like anytime it's yes. below like seventy degrees, <laughs> it cracks me up every time I go I go back to visit. Um, you know here 
when it hits like 35, you go to start going to the grocery store and there's people in shorts. Yeah. Um, you know, you really do adapt. And also I feel like the cold for some reason in California is just, it just hits different than the cold in Minnesota. And I don't know if that has to do with humidity or not, but the cold just feels sharper to me in California, yeah. like a 50 degree day in California. It's just so much colder than a 50 de degree day in Minnesota for some reason. I don't know why. The humidity and, you know, in Arizona, as we were talking about before we started recording, you know, we get to 110, 115 degrees in the summer. And we always say it's a dry heat and it sounds like so cliche and silly, but there's a really a reason why. And like the, the humidity really adds a lot, whether it's hot or cold. I've been in Chicago in the summertime and we were there and they were like, oh, it's going to be 100 degrees today. And we were rolling our eyes like these people don't know anything about the heat. Um, and it was so humid. I was like suffocating when I was walking around outside. It's just, yeah. it's really incredible how that changes things for sure. Yes, it definitely does. <laughs> so how old are your daughters now? My daughters are 16, 18, and 19. At one point every year for a month, they are all one year apart. So I'm oh. going to have a 17 year old nature and a 19 year old. I had them back to back to back. And um, it's funny because they all grew up in the in the cupcake shop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of them works for the cupcake shop now. It's just been um, a really wonderful journey to be able to have that business and to be with my kids while I worked. Have they read all of your books? Um, are they at ages yet where they're reading these types of books? They are at the ages where they read these types of books, but none of my kids are really readers. Mm -hmm. You know, my my middle kid is a reader, but she tends more towards like a romanticy, you know, she's into mm -hmm. like uh, the YA type, you know, dragon type uh, fairy book, you know, stuff. That's what she likes. Um, so yeah, they don't really read my books. I think they absorb them though, sort of by osmosis, just being around me and hearing me talk about them or listen, listening to the audiobook, you know, when I'm uh, checking it for errors before it gets published. Um, so they know what they're, they know what's in them, but they're not mm -hmm. necessarily sitting down and reading them from cover to cover. You mentioned that you loved reading growing up, like throughout your life, you loved reading. What, how did that passion begin? What were the books you liked, uh, uh, liked when you were growing up? I remember reading the, uh, Dr. Seuss books when I was little going to the library with my mom and, you know, re grabbing every Dr. Seuss book that I can. The first adult books that I remember picking up were the Xanth novels by Piers Anthony. And I just blew through those, blew through them. I, I think I read all the way up to like book 42. I remember going to used bookstores and picking those up. My first introduction to romance though, was in my history class, the girl who sat in front of me in history class would come in with these, you know, bodice rippers with the, you know, Fabi. <laughs> oh <cover>. yeah. <laughs> they always had these really gorgeous covers, I remember. And I I would look at over her shoulder what she was reading and she started loaning me her books when she was done. And I remember just reading like paperback after paperback after paperback of romance. And that was, I think my, my first, that was when I fell in love with romance was with those books. They were so formulaic. Um, you know, after a while, it's like, okay, you know, they, they're all, they, they kind of get repetitive. Um, but I've always loved the romance story in any movie that I watch, in any book that I read. Of course, I love the whole Outlander series. I love the romance themes in the Sookie Stackhouse series. You know, those are the kinds of books that I was reading when I still had time to read. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just, I've always loved romance. It's my favorite genre. It's an emotional safe space. You know, you know that you're going to read it. And at the end, you're going to get a happy ever after, happy for now, no matter what happens within the pages. Mm -hmm. What do you, how do you find time to read now as an adult? Well, I do a lot of blurbs. So I'm very lucky um, in my particular line of work that I get a lot of early copies of books that aren't coming out for another eight, nine months. And um, I, I get a lot of requests to blurb romance novels. So I read a lot of romance novels for blurbing. Um, and then I listen to a lot of audiobooks. So when I'm not blurbing or, you know, working, I'm listening to audiobooks. And I, I really like um, historic nonfiction or biographies just because it, it doesn't feel like work. You know, I'm not picking apart like the method when I'm listening to those, like how the book was written, I'm just listening for the story. Um, you know, it's like your, your brain gets rewired when you become an author. And especially when you're reading your own genre, you know, you, you become more, um, critical or, you know, you, you, you look at the, the actual technique involved and not so much the story. You have to like remind yourself, like, no, we're supposed to be having fun. Listen to this. Yeah. And, and enjoy. Um, but yeah, I, I do read a ton. I still read a ton of books, um, mostly audiobooks, though.
What are some of the recent titles that you've really enjoyed or are there any other books by other authors you're looking forward to this year? Well, I really enjoyed This Could Be Us by Kennedy Ryan. Um, that She's a fantastic author. If you've never picked her up, you must try a Kennedy Ryan book. I, I just love her stuff. Um, let's see. I'm listening to Tom Lake right now mm. by Ann Patchett. That's mm. really good. It's narrated by Meryl Streep. So I did pick that one up. Um, let's see what else. I'm also listening to a book about uh, about Marion Davies. I went to Hearst Castle on spring break. Oh. I was really fascinated in her life story. So I'm listening to her biography as well. So yeah, I've got a very eclectic um, reading list that I'm going through right now. What are um, your plans going forward? So, you know, this book just came out. How soon do you start working on the next book? Do you already have ideas sort of in place for what you'll come out with next? So I turned in my 2025 book in January of this year. It's complete. The first draft is complete. It is wonderful. I absolutely am in love with this book. And um, I it's called uh, Say You'll Remember Me. It's about a young woman who is caring for her mother with early onset dementia. Mm. And she falls in love with a grumpy veterinarian. And I don't want to say more than that because I don't want to spoil it, but it's just a really beautiful book that touches on memories and the values of experiences and, you know, what it's like to lose those memories and to forget the people you love. And, um, you know, again, it is a rom-com. So even though it sounds very depressing and at parts, it is very sad, but um, it's also beautifully done and sensitively written. And there are parts of this book that are going to have you absolutely rolling. <laughs> I can't wait to get them narrated. <laughs> how do you, how does that work with your audiobooks? Do you choose the narrator? Um, have you ever, uh, would you ever consider narrating your own books? How does that sort of process work? I got to narrate the acknowledgments and the author interview at the back of Just for the Summer. And I have to tell you, after one hour of doing this, <laughs> I was like, this is not for me. <laughs> this is never <laughs> going to be for me. Uh, no, I do pick all of my narrators. Since I am such a huge audiobook fan, I am extremely particular about my audiobooks, about who narrates my audiobooks. I'm involved from the beginning of the process all the way through till the end. And I love Zachary Weber. I cast him for almost every single one of my heroes. He's just so good at what he does. He just really understands uh, my writing style and the nuances of the characters and the tone. He's just fantastic. And then I tend to pick a different female narrator for each book, depending on the character and who I think she sounds like. But I've used Julia Whalen. I've used Carla Garcia. Kyla Garcia. I've used, um, for this book, Christine Lakin. I think I might use Christine Lakin and Zachary Weber on my next book as well, just because I think that those two would do so, so well at bringing the characters that I've written to life. But I listen to the book before anybody else gets a chance to listen to it. Um, you know, I, I, I've had chapters redone if I thought that the tone was wrong or the you know pacing was off. So yes, I'm very involved. Where do you do your writing? Um, you're talking to us from Minnesota. Do you have like a room? Do you have a space, um, a computer, like a, a special spot that where you feel like you can work the best? I actually write primarily on my cell phone. And oh. every time I, yeah, when I tell people this, there's like this collective gasp um, <laughs> because I think people have this vision of, you know, you're an author and you've got a desk and a fancy office and there's bookshelves in it. And, and I don't even have a desk. I don't have an office. Um, actually, I we're doing a remodel this year because I told my husband, it's kind of ridiculous, right? Like I'm a, I've written seven books um, and I don't have a desk. Like that's, that's wild. Um, I do have to use my laptop when I'm doing edits because those edits take place on a word doc. But when I'm writing a first draft, most of that takes place on my cell phone hmm. on a Google and I will write in my living room. Uh, you know, sometimes I will, you know, take a little break away from the family and go somewhere else to write just so that it's more quiet. Cause I really don't have a quiet spot in my home to get things done. It's honestly sort of miraculous that I've managed to write these books in the environment that I live in. Um, but it was funny because I, my book before this one, yours truly was the book of the year and Lolly award winner for book of the month. And they sent a camera crew out to my house to make, you know, a video with me. And they were asking me like, you show us where you write. And I'm like, but I got nothing. <laughs> like, this, is the living room. This, is, this is where the magic happens. Um, I, there really isn't anything cool to look at. Cause I'm just very transient on my writing. Just wherever I'm at. 
And how long does it take? So, so every, you know, and you mentioned in January is when you turn in the copies, how, like for this, this book, for example, how long did it take you to actually sit down and write? Every book is different. The shortest amount of time it's ever taken me to write a book was two and a half months, but I did. And that book was part of your world, but Mm -hmm. I did lift a lot of things out of a previous book that I had decided not to publish. So I was able to salvage a lot of scenes from that book, a lot of characters from that book that saved me a little bit of time. Uh, I wrote The Friend Zone in three months. I just sat down and just that book just poured out of me, which is ugh, when that happens, it is the best. Um, you know, the other books I take a really long time to write, like Life's Too Short, uh, probably took eight, nine months. You know, I sat down, wrote a little here, a little there. You know, there was times that I sat down and got down a lot of word count. And then other times that I just sort of wrote when I had the chance uh, my book for next year, the, the one I'm turning in in January of next year, which will be my 2026 book, my eighth book, I'm about 60,000 words into that one right now. Okay. So I'm working on that. I'm pretty soon I'm going to get the edits back for See or Remember Me, and I'm going to have to, you know, work on that. It's just, I'm, I constantly have my hands in three books at a time. You know, the one that I'm promoting, which is just for the summer, the one that's coming up next year, which is See or Remember Me, and the one that I'm writing for the year after that, which has no title as of right now. So I have to say, I've never been to Minnesota. I kind of grew up on the West Coast. And there's a really funny reference in the book to like a Toilet King ad. And it sort of comes up throughout the whole book. Is that real? Is that a real ad in Minnesota? Is that something that people there will know? Or is that just part of the part of the book? Uh, It is a fictional billboard for a fictional plumber. However, if you come to Minnesota, you will immediately know what the inspiration was for the Toilet King, because we have um, we have a real estate agent here whose billboards are infamous and prolific. <laughs> they are everywhere. Like you will literally see three <laughs> at one time while you're driving. Um, and you know the the way that I got the idea actually for the me cute um, in this book was um, there was this viral TikTok of somebody who was taking a video of an apartment building that had this real estate agent's billboard directly outside of the window of this apartment building. Like it was so close to the building. It was like, who is this billboard for? Um, And I thought that would be so funny if the main character had a billboard like that right outside the window. I almost actually used this real estate agent in my book. I got his permission and everything very quickly (laughs) allowed me um, the opportunity to use his name in the book, but ultimately I felt like the toilet King was so much more universal. Like you didn't have to understand the inside joke of this, you know, um, real estate agent to get it. But I think we all have that guy in our city. Like it's like a lawyer, you know, it's like a, there's always a billboard and, and the guy built buys up every single one of them and his face is all over the city. I feel like we, that's like a universal experience. We all understand that. Oh yeah. If you come to Phoenix, it's a lawyer and I won't, <laughs> I won't even need to tell you the name because you'll come here and you'll drive and be like, Oh, that's what, who, what he was talking about because he's, yeah. his picture is literally everywhere. You remember this, you remember the jingle. Um, it's just one of those little, uh, funny, unique things about every town, um, that you go into. So, uh, glad to know that that's uh, what to, what to expect when we go to Minnesota. Will you, you said you got the permission from the, from the agent. Will you potentially use that in another book down the road? Or was that something just specific for this one? It was something specific to this one. I can tell you that the toilet King, it's not the last time we will see him. Um, All of my books exist inside of the same universe. So, you know, things that we saw back all the way in book number one, The Friend Zone, you know, we'll get little nods to it in later books. It's it's all in the same universe. So The Toilet King, I mean, you know, considering that my books are continuing in Minnesota and Toilet King is a Minnesota fictional billboard, we will definitely see more of him at some point. <laughs> and we know there's similar, as you just mentioned, characters. Is this a standalone book? I mean, just for people who maybe are just learning more about your work, can they read just for the summer on its own? Or would you recommend them kind of starting from the beginning? All of my books are standalones. You can absolutely pick up any of them and completely enjoy the story without needing to know any backstory. It will feel like its own book um, and and you won't you won't miss anything. But I do love Easter eggs. And if I had the choice, I would tell you to start with my fourth book, which is part of your world, and then read my fifth book, yours truly, and then my sixth book just for the summer, because you will get the most enjoyment out of having met some previous characters before you read just for the summer. And then if you love those three, then of course, go back and start with my backlist and start on book one, the friend zone and work your way you know, back up. But 
Um, there's some really powerful twists in this book, um, some very heart-wrenching things that happen, and they're going to be heart-wrenching whether you have read Part of Your Road or Yours Truly before it, but it will be even better if you have. Towards the end of this book, again, trying not to give spoilers, my heart was beating so fast because I was like, I really hope this is going to end the way that I hope it does. What is it like for you as an author to sort of add that third act, that sort of like last little twist at the very last moment that readers are really not expecting? You know, I go into my books knowing the story before I write them. I'm I am a plotter, but only in my mind. Um, I don't write down I don't follow any sort of like synopsis as I'm writing, but I do completely know from start to finish what's going to happen in my books before I sit down to write them. And that's a rule that I have. I don't just sit down and put words on the page until I know my characters and I know what I think their story is going to be. And of course, that stuff changes as I go. But um, it's always hard to write the third act breakup or it's hard to write the hard things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I say that I know these characters and that I love these characters, I do. In the scenes where you are crying, I am also crying. <laughs> I'm also sad writing it. Um, it hits me the same way it hits everyone else. So yeah, it is um, it is a labor of love. And, you know, I think readers can tell that the author is invested the way that I'm invested when you're reading it because these emotions come through the page. So, you know, just know that when I'm devastating you, I have also devastated myself. <laughs> <laughs> We, you mentioned that growing up, you would read the the romance novels that your your classmate had, the sort of Fabio long hair um, romance books that so many as, of us grew up seeing or had our you know our mom our moms read. How have you seen contemporary romance change over the years in terms of the depth, um, mental health? Mental health is a big part of this book. Have you really seen a lot of changes in the genre? Oh my gosh, yes. Romance is having a moment. If you are, I'm just going to say this, if you are a person who says, oh, I don't like romance. No, I don't read romance. Or you have, you know, a particular take on what you think romance is. I'm going to challenge you to pick up a, a recent modern day romance because it is not what it used to be anymore. Modern day romance is so smart. It is so different and there's a romance for everybody i mean there are literally a plethora of tropes within the trope you know if you want romance that's that spicy we've got that if you want romance it's not as spicy that's more closed door and more about the emotional attachment between that we've got that um there's romance with fantastic representation you know i mentioned this could be us but there's autism representation in this book um it's a second chance romance it's a you know a character who's recently divorced you know these characters are relatable they live in the real world and they're written by incredibly smart people um who are fantastic at telling these stories that make us feel seen so yes i you know i did a speech the other day um, at a fundraising event. And I knew that this event, these were people that, you know, came from all over. They were here to support this organization. They were not necessarily there because they were readers of mine. And I knew that my biggest challenge was going to be to sell these people on the need to read romance, not necessarily my book, but to try romance because there's such a stigma around what people think romance is. And it's just not that anymore. It's not that grab, you know, grab an Emily Henry book, pick up a Farrah Roshan book. You know, there's so many fantastic, fantastic romance novels out there that will completely flip the script on what you think romance is. And I think for me, and one thing that stands out about your book is the female protagonists, they're doctors, they're nurses, they have these roles in the world that are very important and very special. And that hasn't always been the case in, in terms of how females are portrayed, particularly in romance novels. So I feel like as a, a you know, a, a woman in her mid thirties, I think a lot of women my age and younger are really relating to these books a lot more too, because we're in our careers and figuring out if we want to have kids or a family. And uh, there's a, just a lot more types of women that are represented in a lot, a lot of these books for sure, including yours. I agree. You can find romances with more mature heroines in it. Um, you can find romances, really, like I said, you can find a romance that depicts anything you're looking for, anything. Um, you know, I think romances very much reflect the landscape that we live in now. And, you know, women are powerhouses, you know, they're in the, they're in the workforce, they're killing their careers, you know, we're doing it all. We've got the kids or we're choosing not to have kids and living, you know, a child-free life. Like there's so many different 
um, wonderful things that you can learn in a romance novel and put yourself in other people's shoes and other people's positions. You know, it, it expands your brain. It expands your belief system. Um, and I just think romance is such a great way to get there because, again, it is a safe space. You know, you know that no matter what horrible things or difficult, challenging things these characters go to, you know, through, at the end of the book, you will be made whole because that is the requirement of the genre. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have about a minute left on the Zoom. Um, anything else you want to share with readers or listeners uh, about what you want them to know about just for the summer? Uh, you know, I would suggest that you try and support your local indie and go pick up the book at a small independent bookstore if you have that option. Um, I love seeing small businesses flourish. Some, you know, people supported my small business when it was uh, just getting started and they still do it today. And um, that's one of my favorite things that I hear my readers do, supporting small bookstores. Okay. Abby, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.